Mr Speaker, the Indian state can give loans and so can Indian banks. Just as Indians can sell their property to one another, despite what the opening government would have you believe, and Google does exist here and is perfectly accessible to people in India. Meanwhile, the economy chugs along at 5 to 7% growth rates per annum, a healthy rate of growth for a developing country, and yet the government bench comes to us and says India should stop supporting the infant industries that are leading to that growth. It should put its people at the mercy of the free market and the union busters of Walmart when they open their stores here. It should give the wealth and value of all of its assets in its state services to Sergi Brin and the shareholders of Google. We don't think that is a model for approaching the development of a country, and we don't think that that's one that India should engage in. But let's be clear. At Closing Opposition, we don't have to defend every example of cronyism or mismanagement within the Indian state. We think those things are important things to fix, and they should adopt the path of the Asian Tigers in doing so. We've never heard any inherent reason why India is incapable of achieving that, other than it has lots of people. Lots of countries have lots of people and developed systems to be able to regulate and ask them for a vote. But if we did think that there was something inherent about India's political system that leads to these types of failures, it's incredibly problematic to give that actor the task of allocating foreign direct investment to regulating the process of privatisation and assume that that won't involve just as much cronyism as the operation of state-run enterprises in the administration of those contracts that would necessarily be involved in that process of, of privatisation or foreign direct investment. So what are we going to bring you in extension? We're going to show you why the Indian state protections from foreign firms are essential in four key areas. In creating the strength of its firms to be able to compete, the capacity of its labour to be able to organise, the ability to be able to protect its national culture and identity, and the ability to access essential state services, and explain why the radical free market in all of those areas is inappropriate for India. So let's begin. Domestic firms need the strength to be able to compete. A huge proportion of India's middle class are small business owners. They have their livelihoods destroyed by the, like the arrival of foreign firms. Those foreign firms employ fewer people on lower wages, and the revenue and profits associated with the operation of those foreign firms go overseas, and not into the pockets of Indian middle class consumers who are able to direct that funds within that economy and pay taxes on it. We don't think that these firms are un uncompetitive for inherent reasons. We think they're uncompetitive because they haven't had the time to develop. We think they're uncompetitive because they're smaller. We think that domestic competition operates on these firms to encourage them to be competitive, but at least it does it on the same terms. It has the same level of state regulation. They have the access to the same level of interest rates. We don't think that they have the level of inequality that is faced when a smaller, newer Indian firm tries to compete with Walmart that's been around for nigh on 50 years, Mr Speaker. We think that's not a model for assessing whether or not a firm is providing a valuable service. But let's ask you the question, how does the state approach foreign direct investment? How do you get companies to come in? You lower your taxes, you side with firms in labour disputes, you direct infrastructure to the interests of those firms, and here, for low-skilled and low-wage workers, you don't provide training for them because that's not in your interest. Because at any point, they could work for a different firm, and the benefits of that would accrue to your competitor. So we don't think that they're providing some benevolent, important service to the people of India. What does the closing government add to this? They say these firms have information and they have a capacity to be able to respond to price signals. We don't think that there's anything about a private sector firm that gives it a necessary advantage in research. We think the same types of tools you can use to assess market demand, the same type of surveys and research that private firms do all the time, is it possible? And even if you think that the private sector is the best way to do it, it's fine to hire consultants to advise you on those questions. But we think the free market misses price signals all the time, especially when we look to the example of like whether or not people want to continue to buy houses that are consistently 10% more expensive year on year despite everybody already having a house. It's a big price signal that the free market missed to great catastrophe. We think that the capacity of the state to go to protect from those types of risks is undermined. Second point in this speech, you need to protect organised labour and regulate that labour market to enable them to be able to negotiate wages and market conditions fairly. Labour market restrictions or an established union movement is essential for that protection. And these guys wanted to kind of rubbish the model of regulation of hiring and firing decisions. They fail to recognise that those decisions have huge social consequences. And at the same time, the firm is getting a huge benefit from being able to operate in that state. We think that trade-off is exactly something the state should mitigate and regulate. It's right for the state to require firms to share their profits with their workers, because that's the deal that's struck in a social contract that allows them to make huge amounts of profit within that society. 
We don't have to support those decisions being arbitrary, but you should, and obviously you should be able to dismiss somebody for cause, but we think especially, and this is an extension, when the project of breaking down caste-based inequality is still in progress, throwing the system over to the free market is exactly the wrong time to do it, because capital accumulation occurs from that unequal starting point at which different castes and different identities within the state have hugely different capacity to be able to accrue capital. That's how you lock in the levels of inequality for generations that African Americans see, because they're at a disadvantage point at which the economic development began. We think that's exactly the wrong time for India to engage in this type of policy. Third point in this speech, why foreign firms come uh, uh, with foreign conceptualizations of culture and social organization, and that's a threat. I'll take opening in just a second. Foreign firms sell mass-produced crap at incredibly low prices to grab market share, Mr. Speaker. They use their incredible marketing technology and budgets to hook children on their products and then lower wages through labor deregulation so consumers can only afford to buy those products. So the reality is, is that Western products, Western ideas are the types of consumer goods that people should buy. Western ideas are the types of films and music you should consume, are the ones that are pushed upon children and national identities are subsumed to that cultural hegemony of those states opening. If you want domestic firms to compete, then why do you limit hiring and firing and have state-owned enterprises that mean they can't compete, particularly because there's no meaningful reason why international businesses evilly want to sell you crappy stuff, but domestic businesses will still only sell you magically good stuff? Because we think there is a balance between exposing firms to competition and exposing them to competition in a way that facilitates their growth over time. The question is, does the Indian storekeeper have to compete with Walmart on the first day of opening? We don't think that's an effective comparison. The Indian state should engage in that regulation. Obviously, they didn't all open tomorrow, but you get the general drift, Mr. Speaker, right? So the final part of this speech is that foreign firms owning essential government services put shareholder profits above accessibility and important social goals. The services absolutely should go to where the votes are and not where the money is, because votes represent demand as well, Mr. Speaker, the demand of voters for services. The point being, though, that those votes are equally distributed when the money is not between castes, between sections of society, and between all strata of people who exist in the community. We think that equal distribution is the best way to manage it. So for a Side that was so worried about the hotel just having generators, they were willing to turn the provision of electricity over to companies that would have an incentive to provide that electricity to hotels that were able to pay for it, and not to consumers who lived in slums who weren't able to pay for it. And it was exactly those dynamics that the closing opposition stood against.